Hey folks, this little GTX 650 cost me about £11 and it's the same card that I Frankenstein back to life out of two scrap cards that I had bought on eBay. But butchering a card together is one thing, whether or not it was worth it is a completely different story. So, trying to think of a fair test, I decided to compare it to the results of the GTX 560, which I recently squared up against the R7 250X from AMD. But before we get into the card, remember to like, share and subscribe, and before we start, head down to the comment section and say which one you think is going to come out on top, the newer Kepler based 650 or the fiery Fermi based 560. Back in the summer of 2011, Nvidia released the GTX 560 based on the Fermi GF114 GPU, a refined version of the previous GF104 GPU seen in the GTX 460. At launch, the card came in at just about under $200, and today it can be had for around $20 to $30 on the used market. The GTX 650 it launched just about a year later in Q3 of 2012, and it was aimed firmly at the budget market with an MSRP of about $110, and is based on the newer GK107, the 07 donating the lower end skew of the Kepler family, and unlike the GTX 560 which requires two 6-pin power connectors, we get away with one 6-pin for the GTX 650. The Fermi card packed fewer CUDA cores at 336 compared to the Kepler card's 384, but looked to counter that with 56 texture mapping units compared to the 650's 32, and it also doubled the number of ROPs up to 32 from the Kepler card 16. In terms of memory, the GTX 560 has also got the benefit of a 256-bit memory bus compared to the 128-bit on the GTX 650, but when it came to clock speeds, the Kepler card it had an advantage here, with significantly higher core clock speeds of 1050 MHz compared to the 810 of the GTX 560 and a nice boost to the VRAM speeds too, being 5 GHz effective at stock instead of 4 GHz on the 560. Now, like all low-level NVIDIA cards, the GTX 650 it was a huge success, loads of people snapped it up, and this is part of the reason why you can easily pick one up today so cheaply, as there's so much of them going for sale online. Overclocking can be done to some extent on either of these cards, and the final clock speeds achieved are listed in the brackets. Interestingly, the smaller fan used in my GTX 650, it didn't appear to hamper the frequencies achieved too much, and all in all, it represented a nice little boost over stock settings. So is the GTX 650 even worth the £11 or $14 I paid for it? Well, let's boot it up and couple it to the old faithful i5-4590 test rig and dive into the benchmarks to find out. Kicking things off with Skyrim SE and at 1080p on the medium preset with absolutely no anti-aliasing, well, even at stock clocks, the GTX 560 romps ahead of the 650 with an average frame rate of 34 and the minimum sitting just under 30. Overclocking the 560 resulted in the average frame rate jumping closer to 40 FPS, while the minimums managed to hit 30. But when we overclocked the 650, we couldn't even match the stock clocked 560, with the average frame rate hitting 30 FPS while the minimum stayed in the low 20s. Dropping the resolution down here to 900p, it does help the 650, and we've seen its percentile minimums creep closer to 30 FPS, but it's not exactly a stellar start for this baby Kepler card. Pray now at 900p on the medium preset with FXAA and 16x AF, and this is a title which I always say continues to impress. But on the GTX 650, even when using relatively low settings, it looks like we could be asking a little bit too much of this baby Kepler. At stock clocks, the 560 it pushed considerably ahead of the 650 in terms of both average frame rate and the average minimums. Overclocked, the GTX 650 offered up slightly more palatable performance, with the lows staying closer to 40 FPS than 30, but with averages that were nowhere near 60 FPS. The best bet here for the 650 would simply be to lock it at 30 FPS to try and maintain a smooth, stable, and still impressive looking experience or dial back some of those more taxing settings to a lower preset, turn off the anti-aliasing, and try and get the game ticking a little bit closer to 60 FPS. Now the oldest title in this suite of benchmarks with Tomb Raider 2013. Now at 1080p on the normal preset, it was a lot more comfortable for the Kepler GPU. Here the 650 returned on average of 52 FPS compared to the 560's 88, which is still a considerable gap, but overclocking the 650 did help push the averages a little bit closer to 60 FPS. Cranking the settings up to the high preset, returned averages above 40 FPS on the 650, 
and at these higher settings, even when the 560 was overclocked, the average minimums couldn't quite hit 60 FPS, so there was never any real danger of the 650 being able to tickle that mythical 60 FPS mark. Still, locking it at 30 FPS like we did with Prey, it would offer up a more than comfortable experience on the 650, and I guess you can see that this is becoming a common thread in this test. Now jumping into the newer Rise of the Tomb Raider, threw up the first fail of the day. Even at the lowest preset, at 720p, the 650 it just simply failed to start up, let alone benchmark, with the game complaining about the amount of resources available. Now I know for a fact you can technically get the game running on a 650, but when it comes down to individual game tweaks, you're probably going to want to look up Low Spec Gamer. As it stands, out of the box, the 650 just didn't have enough grunt to get Rise of the Tomb Raider going. So finally, we finished off the testing by hopping back into a game that's generally Generally kinder to lower end hardware, Battlefield 1. Now at 900p in the low preset, the GTX 560 returns frame rates well above 70 FPS on average, with the average minimums hovering in the mid 50s. At stock clocks, the GTX 650 was also fairly impressive here, returning an average frame rate on par with the average minimums seen on the 560. So, in short, it's the older, fiery Fermi based 560 which very much comes out on top. Probably not that much of a surprise really as the 650 was meant to be more of a replacement for the much loved 550Ti, rather than the bigger GPU found in the 560. So what's the takeaway from this test then? Well for the price I paid, under $15, then it's a mix of unexpected surprise. I mean we could still play some relatively new games like Prey and Battlefield 1, all at reasonable frame rates, while at the same time there was also a little bit of disappointment knowing that by just spending a little bit more, you could have a card that copes much much better in modern titles. The TLDR then, for esports titles you're going to be fine with this card. You're going to be able to lock it at 60 FPS and you're going to be able to have a good time with it. For mainstream titles though, on the whole, they're all playable to some extent, but with considerably scaled back settings. If you need a card however to play some classic games, think games released up until 2012-2013, then the GTX 650 is going to suit your needs absolutely perfectly. But that's it for today folks, I hope you've enjoyed this little look back at the GTX 650, and let me know if any of you are still using it, and what you think of them, or if it was worth the price that I paid. Anyway, as always folks, take care, and I'll see you all in the comments section down below, and in the next video.